Snails are almost definitely not the reason you would want to visit a zoo, but I think I might be able to change your mind about that by the end of this video. So when London Zoo said I could come and make videos and art about my experiences there, I knew that I wanted to learn about the creatures I don't normally think of when I think zoos. It's easy to understand why someone would spend a year trying to save a family of gorillas, but it's baffling to me why multiple zoos across the globe would spend 40 years trying to save one type of snail. So I came to meet a snail expert and kind of rudely ask why snails? So it's, I mean, it's a big question. We... That's Sam. He's a manager of ectotherms at the Zoological Society of London. And an ectotherm is an animal that needs help to keep its body warm because it can't do it internally like you or I can. A snail is an ectotherm. And having worked with them at London Zoo for about 10 years, he's the perfect person to tell us why they matter so much. You've kind of got to think about the species themselves, so Parchula. These animals were being managed and maintained primarily in the beginning in university collections back in the 1960s and 1970s for studies of speciation, so looking at how animals evolve over time and trying to answer some really specific questions. Now I'll get to those specific type of questions he's talking about in a second, but I want to emphasize what Sam has just mentioned here. Parchula snails are quite famous, not to animal lovers like you or me, but amongst evolutionary biologists because they've been studied for evolution for over a hundred years. Parchula snails are ideal for learning more about how animals change over time, speciation, because of how quickly they can change from a common ancestor. Actually, you may already be familiar with this work, just not through snails. You may have heard of Darwin's finches. These are the birds that Darwin saw on his trip to the Galapagos Islands and he noticed that the finches there were spread out over the islands and they all looked similar except for their beaks. They all had different beaks that were thicker or thinner or wider or longer depending on which food they were eating in their part of the islands. Each was a different species and had evolved quickly from a common ancestor. This is a perfect example of a type of change called adaptive radiation. And the word radiation here has nothing to do with nuclear energy, but instead means to spread outwards from the center to radiate like the spokes on a wheel, which describes the parchula snails perfectly because there hasn't been just one, but over 120 different parchula species and ZSL has worked with about 100 of those. This is actually where the story starts because they were being studied so closely, we quickly noticed there was a problem. For Parchula, you saw them going, you saw them disappearing. And there was something that we could effectively do at that moment. If we didn't do something about it, they would have gone. And it's the story of them doing something about it that has opened my mind and changed it when I consider the efforts that people put into saving the animals they care for. This story has so many strange parts and the first step they have to go through is to figure out why. Why are the Parchula snails disappearing? Well, the first why kind of blows your mind when you see it. It's the East African giant land snail. Unlike most snails that are probably the size of your thumb, the giant African snail is about the size of your hand. They've been introduced to lots of places around the world, but not everyone has been happy about this. Obviously the introduction of the giant African land snail to the islands during the 1940s, 50s, 60s, that was a catastrophe for the economy of the islands. They, they were a real problem, basically because they would eat anything and everything. Um, they're fabulous creatures. The East African land snail, which is the one that's, um, that was introduced, amazing breeding animals, beautiful animals, but outside of their ecology, they can be catastrophic. And that species has been introduced to vast swathes of the earth. Why, why was it introduced to different places? Uh, for a few different reasons, but one, of, one idea was, uh, one thing that was happening at the time was people thought you might want to eat more snails. Now, it's not new for snails to be used as a food source, and I'm sure you've heard of the French snail dish escargot. But when you introduce a new species into an environment, you do run the risk of it escaping and causing a bit of havoc, which is exactly what happened. There was a lot of farming happening on these islands and these big snails have big appetites and they began eating everything. 
Now, unlike the tiny parchula snails who birth live young, maybe once or twice a month, the giant African snail births hundreds of eggs each year, which meant the crops of the farms there were very quickly being taken over by swarms of snails. To try and deal with that problem, yeah. the French Polynesian government were looking out for solutions, any solution, to try and reduce down the impact. And as it happened, there were experiments going on on islands looking at how predatory snails, Euglandina rosea, the rosy wolf snail, there's another species called Ganaxis that was also being used, um, could be used to sort of control the population of giant African land snails. Now, looking back on it, we have a fundamental problem with how those studies were undertaken and the results of those studies. Um, we don't believe that they ever really showed that there was any control that Euglandina, the rosy wolf snail, had on African land snails. We just don't, we just don't think they were effective. Now, before this, I had never heard of a predatory snail species, a species of snail that eats other snails. But this idea of bringing in another species to control an invasive one is familiar. It's a form of biological control. And it makes sense. You simply introduce a natural predator to that species and the populations will balance. But that also comes with the risk that the second species, the one you've introduced, will dominate and then itself become invasive. What we think happened on those islands is actually you had a natural dieback of the African land snails. That quite regularly happens in a wild state. They do very well at first and then they drop right back. You see large die-offs, usually because of disease. Um, okay. so Basically, the giant snails were thought to be dying of natural causes and the timing of the rosy wolf snails being introduced to hunt them was just a coincidence that made it look as though the rosy wolf was successfully hunting the giant snails. So the big bad rosy wolf is here. Now, I have to say, it's a particularly beautiful snail if you can describe a snail that way. However, beauty aside, it is an effective snail predator. And with small creatures, I like to imagine that I'm their size to consider how scary it would be if I were to experience that. And if I were as little as the parchula snail, seeing the rosy wolf coming over the horizon would be terrifying. With the way it looks and how it hunts other snails, it's like something straight out of a sci-fi or fantasy book. Most snails, like the parchula, have four tentacles on their heads, two long ones on the top for seeing and the two shorter ones on the bottom for tasting and smelling. However, the rosy wolf has six and the two extra are huge. People often describe them as a big mustache because they come out from the side, but from the parchula's perspective, they probably look like jaws you can't escape. The rosy wolf actually use them to find the trails of the snails they like eating. And when they find one, they hunt it down. And they're just slightly faster than a lot of other snail species. So it turns into this kind of slow motion pursuit where the prey has its future set. It will get eaten. This really reminds me of the story of Mortal Engines. It's a fantasy series by a British author called Philip Reeves about a post-apocalyptic world where every city and town tries to survive by consuming each other. The way they do this is by putting their cities on the wheels so you have these basically mountains chasing each other for days or weeks until all the smaller ones are extinct. This is pretty much what happened. The rosy wolf plan backfired and instead of hunting the giant African snail which were too big for it to eat, they went for smaller prey. They went for the tiny parchulas that were native to the islands. Luckily for the parchulas, there were a couple of scientists who were out collecting these snails and they just started seeing their dead shells everywhere. There were waves of extinction happening to these native species and the scientists working with the snails linked the deaths of the parchulas to the rosy wolves. That's what happened to the parchula snails. They were hunted to extinction until the only populations alive were the ones collected in zoos. Very early on, or relatively early on, we were looking at, or our keepers here at London were looking at how to reintroduce them. And there were actually attempts to reintroduce them into reserve sites in French Polynesia, in Morea. Um, 
it's as odd as you think. So if you think about a reserve that you might get in South Africa for something yeah. like a, a lion, tiger, any of the, we were thinking along those types of lines. Right, the okay. So the first reserve that was built was about 12 meters by 12 meters. Okay. So it was sort of generally tagged as the smallest reserve in the world at the time. As small as a reserve like that is, it's surprisingly difficult to maintain. You need to consider other wildlife that may impact any snails you reintroduce. If the area is too remote, then it can be tricky to get back to, and trees collapse in those areas all the time. So reserves can be destroyed in an instant. Um, so we, this has been a long project. Um, so there's been snails here at London Zoo since the late 80s, and I've got uh, curator and keepers here who have been with these snails the whole way through the time. Um, Dave Clark and Paul Pierce Kelly were actually involved with collecting some of these species out of the wild originally. Um, so we've got a very long history with these animals. So this project to save the snails has been happening since the late 80s and that's a long time to be working on something. So how do you know when it's done? How do you know the species have been reintroduced into the wild? So there's two bits to consider with this. One is the actual populations themselves and what they're doing. And the other is how do we describe that and talk about it? The, the two are slightly different in a way. Okay. So the populations themselves, we've now released for various different species of Parchula, we've released several thousand of quite a number of them. And what we're looking for is persistence in the population. It's not good enough for us just to go, right, we've put out 2,000 adults into this area. And then we came back a few weeks later and there were still some adults there. Therefore, we've reintroduced them. That's not good enough. Yeah. What we need is show a, a good solid sign that they are properly going through all their life stages in the wild. So they are reproducing, those youngsters are growing up and going through. Has the species been able to go through all their life stages in the wild? This, I think, is such a great way of describing a successful reintroduction. I did wonder if this was sustainable though. Can they continue to survive in the wild after having been born and raised in glass cages for generations? The answer is yes. Okay. And we know that now, um, and it's one of those interesting processes. Do they then go back to being the wild snails that they would have been 30 or 40 years ago? Um, and so yes, we, this is something that Parchula, one of the questions that Parchula is answering as we go through. They were extinct in the wild species that have been reintroduced, never seen the captive environment before, and are now living as proper adult snails out in the wild. I think this is just really impressive. A big criticism I had for zoos before talking with them was about wanting them to send animals back, to rewild them. But my time with Sam has made me realize how complex something like that really can be, even with something as small as snails. Okay, so we know they can survive and they can be rewilded, which is incredible. But how are we tracking them? How can we track thousands of snails? tiny things that are released back into the wild. Surely we can't just tag them like we do with larger animals, like putting bracelets on bird legs. Well, the answer is surprisingly simple and familiar for artists. They just paint their shells. Each Parchula species is sent out into the wild with a tiny amount of color on their shells, so researchers can track them when they revisit. This color actually also shines in ultraviolet light, so they're a lot easier to see rather than kind of having to pick through each individual leaf. But what this means is, if they find a species of Parchula in the wild with no paint on their shells, new generations are being born in the wild. Naturally, they have backup ways of telling if they are new snails in case the paint just kind of comes off over time. But this is a quite reliable and low cost way of testing this. Plus, it's non-invasive and non-toxic, so win-win. This isn't the end though. ZSL and the other zoos they work with have successfully reintroduced some Parchula species back into the wild. But like I mentioned, there are a lot more of them that this needs to be done with. And not just snails or other ectotherms, but hundreds of other species that we've never heard of. There is so much effort being poured into helping these animals that now I find it incredibly difficult to sit in front of the experts doing this work and just criticize them.
Sam and the other experts will admit that a lot of the time it's not ideal to pull these animals out of their natural environments and bring them to a place like London. But just in something as small as the parchula snail, we can see how much effort is required to save a single species. And this is happening in zoos around the world. I said at the beginning of this series that I want to explore the work people are doing to save animals. I want to remove my ego and challenge my own anti-zoo beliefs. It's working. Sitting with people that are doing the work that I've never done before, that I've never asked about or heard of, is showing me that I shouldn't be so quick to criticize. And in some places, I should just be celebrating what has been achieved, like successfully reintroducing some snail species back into the wild. I said to you that I might be able to change your mind about wanting to go and see snails at a zoo. I hope I have. I hope if you're in London and you decide to visit London Zoo, you take time to go and see the tiny giant section. And while you're there, Ask about the story I haven't told you about the Parchula rosea that I've been painting. Speaking of which, I think it's about time you saw the finished piece. So thank you for watching. Subscribe so you're here for when I drop episode three. And now, hopefully, you know a little bit more about the Parchula snail.